Hi, Blaze. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Hey, how you doing? Good, good. Um, so I got a chance to train with you a few months ago in the internal martial arts, just a little bit. We had two sessions together while I was in the New Mexico area, but really enjoyed that. And uh, um, I think my, yeah, my friend Cameron introduced us and really grateful that I had the opportunity to train with you. And I think in general, I find it really helpful to get to know someone and like hear about their background and how they think about things when I'm learning from them and working with them. And so I wanted to invite you to the podcast just to get to know you better and also share what I learned with other folks. So I really appreciate you joining me today. Um, oh, yeah, great. Thanks for having me. So maybe just to start, I'll ask you the question that I ask everyone, which is uh, to tell, tell me about your life and your life story. And you can answer that in whatever length you like, in whatever way you like. Sure. Yeah, well, I guess uh, in relation to martial arts and internal arts and how we came across each other, um, I guess my life kind of started there. I was uh, actually born in my father's Kung Fu school back in 1986 here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, at that time, um, he was doing a variety of martial arts from internal to external. And uh, I never really trained all that much through my childhood. Um, largely, he was teaching adults, didn't really have the kids class thing going. But he uh, is kind of where my martial arts uh, journey starts, ultimately. Um, and uh, so, yeah, pretty much my whole childhood, although, you know, I liked martial arts. I was kind of, you know, a wild kid in that sense. I never really trained and didn't really have an interest. My father wasn't the type to force me to do it. Um, quite the opposite. If you wanted to get something out of him, you kind of had to poke and prod and really make it, uh, you know, hassle him into showing you something. So uh, all the way up through until I graduated high school, I didn't really do much martial arts. At that time, I was really into art. I was really into doing like graffiti and uh and uh, hip hop and just kind of, um, yeah, martial arts didn't really cross my radar at that point. Um, then I guess it would have been about 2005. Um, I had a friend and a couple friends that were doing like kickboxing and uh, I was invited to watch one of their ring fights where they would, their school would kind of have an open night where they'd have all the students get together and spar. And, uh, and so that kind of piqued my interest, just seeing a different approach from what I had originally been uh, influenced by from my father and seeing kind of a more hard Muay Thai put on this plastic gear and just uh, try to beat the crap out of each other. And, uh, so I guess that was kind of, you know, opened my eyes to there being a, a benefit to having some kind of fighting skills. And at that point, although I was literally born in a Kung Fu school, I was basically as uh, untrained as anyone off the street. Um, and so at that time, when I had went back to my father and said, you know, well, hey, let's, let's open the school up again um, because it had shut down years prior for various different reasons. And then many manifestations of martial arts schools through my childhood and all the way up until the current time. So this was kind of in between one manifestation of schools and the next. And, uh, you know, my father's answer was, well, if you want to learn how to fight, you want to do martial arts, you need a school you need a laboratory where you can have a bunch of different bodies, a bunch of different people to play with. You can invite people from other schools, from other styles, because you can't really like they show in the movies, just go off in the mountains by yourself and invent something that is very useful. Um, the interesting thing about martial arts is that building upon, you know, who knows how long human practice and human evolution that's gone into these arts um, that have continuously been handed down to our present day. So you kind of have to ground yourself in the basics 
to give you the freedom to really kind of pick apart some of the more abstract stuff you find in especially Kung Fu, but other martial arts as well. Um, so at that time, we, we had enough support from other people. I had, you know, different friends that were interested and different people that just kind of came out of the woodwork. And we opened up uh, the Dragon Ball Kung Fu School, I think that was in 2005. And uh, I guess I should explain, my father previously had a, a, the first manifestation of the Dragon Ball Kung Fu School, which was trying to bring masters from China over. And so they brought several over. And then when 9-11 happened, we couldn't get any visas for them. And so that kind of made that whole uh, program crash and burn purely because we wouldn't let any, anybody over anymore. And uh, so we opened it up again. We went under the same name, Dragon Ball Kung Fu School. We still kind of had, a, you know, some people in the community that were remnants of the first school. And uh, and then, yeah, we started up again. And, uh, you know, I guess from that point, I, I went pretty full time at it. Um, you know, I went from not practicing at all to, you know, doing it seven days a week often and trying to run the school and keep the school open and pay the rent it required pretty much 100% of my time when I wasn't working the various other jobs that I was doing to support myself financially at the time. Um, and then yeah that that school went you know I guess we, we kind of closed that manifestation in uh, 2000. 17 somewhere in there she's on end of 2016 2017 somewhere in there and uh and so yeah i mean you know there's a lot to unpack but that's kind of the the broad timeline of uh when i started my martial arts practice to where i am now mm -hmm. um, is there anything on that you want me to expand upon or any questions that brings up or i'm sure there's a lot of details to pull out of that if you find mm -hmm. it interesting absolutely i think um, maybe just to start, if I'm remembering correctly, your parents were both Johnnies, right? Like they went to St. John's College in Santa Fe, is that right? Right, yeah. Um, so uh, both my parents were from the East Coast, although, you know, I guess my, my dad moved around when he was a kid, but um, they're transplants to New Mexico and St. John's brought them here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I forgot, I can't even tell you when they would have been doing that. I guess they were probably in St. John's in 1980, somewhere in there. Hmm. I'm curious, like, oh, so that's of course a connection because I went to St. John's in Annapolis and graduated in 2013. And, you know, when I, when I saw you a few months ago, that was the first time that I'd seen the Santa Fe campus. And um, I guess the question that's coming to mind is something like, what was that like for you as a kid? To grow up with your parents as Johnny's and like what did you make of <laughs> St. John's or that, that part of their background? Well um needless to say my memory of that is non-existent because I mm -hmm. think uh yeah I, but but you know being the offspring of of their uh influence from St. John's um you know my parents are kind of a funny situation being that uh they're both from the east coast um you know I'd say middle class upbringing um and uh they kind of rebelled from wanting the white picket fence suburban lifestyle that they were raised in and so you know saint john's i think probably offered them the initial out as university does for a lot of people it gives you a, a spot on the map away from your hometown and you start for whatever gets your interest there um and New Mexico is an interesting state, you know, they call it the land of entrapment, where people come for a trip and then, you know, they end up moving here for the rest <laughs> of their life. So they're kind of in that category where when they came from the East Coast to New Mexico, they saw how different life was and how, how you could live a, a radically different life here than you could on the East Coast. And so St. John's kind of was the stepping stone to that. Um, and, you know, my, my dad's kind of a funny situation and I couldn't tell you all the politics and the, the reasoning behind, but he, uh, somewhere along his, his last year 
became disenfranchised with St. John's and decided that he was going to quit and not get his degree just to spite all those guys. His mentality at the time. Um, with that being said, he was still cut from that cloth, right? So it was still like, you know, the environment where he fit in and he was still, you know, kind of a bird of the feather, whether or not he at the time wanted to rebel against the institution on some level. Um, and so that kind of led them to life in New Mexico, which, um, you know, New Mexico is an interesting place. And the, the neighborhood I grew up outside of Santa Fe at the time was kind of a wild place. It was a ghost town that was uh, basically just taken over by hippies and bikers that had squatted in this little ghost town. And uh, so it was kind of the wild west back then. And I think that kind of is what attracted them to that area of people could kind of live a little more free and it wasn't quite the East Coast suburban uh, cookie cutter way of life that they were used to growing up. Um, and so me, I'm the offspring of having grown up out in the, the little town of uh, Madrid, New Mexico, um, which is about 30 some miles uh, away from Santa Fe. And if you were to go there today, you'd never really understand its past because now it's, you know, a quaint little town with million dollar houses on Main Street and Hollywood movies being filmed there. And it has a pretty colorful history um, and a very uh, long history. You know, the, some of the, the silver mines in that area date back to the Conquistador days. So there is you know, a long history in that area. Um, but by the time they got there, it was kind of coming, it was still kind of the Wild West, but it was modernizing a little bit back in the 80s, whereas in the 60s, 70s, that area was pretty wild, kind of uh, no man's land to some extent. And uh, so I, I, needless to say, didn't grow up the suburban lifestyle. Um, I grew up where, you know, they, they bought property with no running water, no utilities, nothing, built a little shack out in the hills. And, uh, and so my upbringing compared to their upbringing was, was quite opposite ends of the spectrum, to say the least. Um, and New Mexico is, in my opinion, it's like no other state I've been to. It's kind of like uh, in between America and another country in the way that in the way that uh, at least it was, it's radically changing as money's moving in, Hollywood's moved in to film movies here. So, but uh, it used to kind of have that Wild West appeal, which is quite rapidly disappearing, sad to say. What was it like for you to grow up in that way where you're sort of like off the grid? Um, you know, interest, you know, hard, of course, as a kid, it's, it's not very pleasant. I mean, you know, hauling water and, uh, you know, not having, uh, lights that you can trust running all the time, you know, back when solar systems were pretty uh, new technology and finicky to say the least. Um, so, you know, I mean, I guess, uh, at the time it was probably, I couldn't see the benefits of it. However, retrospectively, you know, I can definitely see the, the unique situation that I guess is getting rarer and rarer. It used to be more common where people could kind of do that, where now it's kind of uh, modernization just doesn't allow the same, the same upbringing as I was used to for good and bad, but I guess it's inevitable. Um, so, you know, I guess for me, um, you know, during the school days, it was largely unpleasant because, you know, you got to drive 40 minutes to get in town to school. And, you know, there's a lot of work to live that way. But, you know, the other benefit of that is, you know, you are more in charge of your own, uh, your own life. You're a little more independent. You're not, you know, dependent on the utilities. And uh, so there's that benefit to it. But uh, I guess it's, you gain something, you lose something, regardless of which one you get. They're kind of good and bad in the opposite ends of the spectrum. But, uh, you know, for me, it's all I ever knew. So I can't, I have no context to an East Coast life like my parents had, which made 
the New Mexico kind of Wild West lifestyle appealed to them more. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess that's everyone's story to some extent. Hmm. I'm curious if with either of those factors on your childhood, like one, your parents being Johnny's or two, like living off the grid, if there's ways that you've discerned as an adult that those impacted you that seem different than like your friends or other people you meet? Um, well, yeah, I'm sure. I think uh, it gave me context that maybe a lot of people don't get. Um, so I think it probably made me a little more uh, adaptable than, than people that are always uh, kind of surrounded in a, a bubble of comfort that modern life provides. Um, I think that has, you know, it was definitely beneficial when you travel to another country, especially when you get to places that are not developed countries where if you're stuck in your first world comfort bubble, you kind of have a little uh, reality shock. So I think it definitely helped with that to some extent. Um, and uh, I think years later, especially after living in China for a couple of years, it was completely opposite ends of the spectrum. So going from growing up where there's, you know, very few people around to living in a city of, you know, 11 million people where there's just somebody everywhere you go, there's a person there. And it's just a constant hive of activity. So that gave me context that, you know, had I grown up in New York City, if I wouldn't have felt radically different other than the obvious, you know, cultural stuff. Um, and I think that gave me, you know, it definitely gave me the ideas post China to go back to more of a lifestyle of my childhood where, you know, quiet space, uh, freedom, all of that is, is something we take for granted until you kind of don't have it. And then, and, you know, little stuff, just the ability to be around where you don't constantly hear car horns honking. Like some people, their whole life, there's always been a car horn honking. And that's a reality that I never understood going from the hills where you hear coyotes wailing, but you never hear no car horns honking. And then living in a city where all night long, all day long, it's just constant car horns. It, uh, in some ways, you could say it gives you context, which gives you perspective. And that definitely made me appreciate New Mexico more. And uh, I guess, you know, there's a longer discussion as to why I moved back and why my, you know, my whole current goal of trying to uh, make a comfortable, more self-sufficient life in New Mexico, which is, you know, ultimately to support my practice and all my other various projects and hobbies. Um, but if I didn't have that context, I may not have really had that. If I grew up in a big city and went to another place, um, conversely, you know, you go to a third world country, I'm sure the people that grow up in a big city freak out when they have to use an outhouse for the first time, or they don't have, you know, running water everywhere they go. And so, you know, I guess that, that just kind of is a subjective upbringing that gives you that. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Are there any ways that you can see that your parents, having been educated by St. John's, uh, impacted you similarly to that? Um, well, you know, I guess it is interesting because, you know, my parents having got uh, coming out of a different social economic class than my upbringing. You know, New Mexico is super poor as a state. I went to all public schools. Um, you know, the majority of the classes I was in, I was the only white kid, which most states, that's probably not as common, you know. So um, it was interesting in that fact alone of, you know, often elementary school, junior high, I was like one of the two white kids in the whole class which uh, New Mexico's history is pretty unique when you look at how that has influenced culture here today, all the way from the 
conquistador days. You know, Santa Fe is the, the oldest capital city in the country hmm. because of the long history of uh, the Spaniards and the natives. And so um, today there's still, you know, remnants of that and still roots of that. And uh, so it's kind of interesting um, going to the school where most of my friends, most of my classmates were Hispanic. Um, and, you know, my elementary school was kind of interesting because it was uh, two miles away from the state penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of the kids who went there, either their parents, I mean, you know, I would say the majority, but a good number of them, their parents were the prison guards or their parents were in the prison as wow. inmates. And they were there waiting to get out or because they worked there. So uh, I was kind of the other very small group of kids that were the rural out in the hills area that were even past the state pen, which, you know, they pushed the penitentiary to the city limits. And then I was another 15, 20 miles past it. So there was a small group of the rural students, which was a mix of, uh, you know, some of the hippie kids, some of the biker kids and a lot of the natives and Hispanics. And uh, so, my upbringing was not your average white American upbringing. And so some of my relatives back East, you, you know, I can see the difference just by, you know, just your environment, you're going to have changes you're not even aware of until you're kind of brought out of it. Um, so as far as my, my parents going to St. John's, you know, I guess you, you could ask the, is it nature or nurture question? Did St. John's mold them or were they attracted to St. John's because of the people they were? I would argue the latter more than the former. And in many ways, I guess, you know, the way I generally feel about institutions, I'd say that's kind of, kind of the case is, uh, although maybe we give them the credit for, uh, or being the vehicle, uh, it's really about the destination to some extent. And um, institutions, in my opinion, are not. And again, that's part of my upbringing. You know, I didn't go to university. I am a product of New Mexico public education, which is probably at the lowest tiers of all of the 50 states of public education as far as New Mexico goes. So in that regard, the St. John's reality, I am completely unaware of in that context. However, post-school, I've had many, many St. John's students as my students, um, more than I can even count. So I kind of have one foot in and one foot out. I don't have a, a St. John's mindset or, or that kind of way of thinking that it instills through St. John's, although I definitely have maybe some remnants of that just by my upbringing. And uh, the other side of that is, you know, I, I have the New Mexico public education half of that, which um, some would argue is more about preparing you for jail than for <laughs> life. And so it's interesting context to, to, you know, yeah, I, you know, have the friends that, you know, are more the St. John's realm. And I have the friends that are in prison that have been drug overdosed, that have been shot by gangs and, and stuff. So it's given me, I guess, that whole spectrum from, you know, speaking with, with guys like you who obviously have a good bit of education and studying and, and, and uh, time under your belt in that world. But, you know, I also have a fair amount of time with friends who, uh, you know, a year or two ago, I just had to get shot by a drug addict. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, life is that and New Mexico kind of gives you that land of, uh, it's kind of an enigma in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And had I been purely in the St. John's socioeconomic uh, <laughs> tier, I probably wouldn't have as much of that. So you know, uh, the majority of people who are coming from that background wouldn't have been going to a public school here. They'd be going to the private schools. They probably wouldn't have had some of the same uh, interactions I had just purely by where I was coming out of. So, uh, you know, for good and bad. And, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way looking back on it now.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I think it is such an interesting mix of backgrounds and experiences. So I, I don't know. I think um, the point you make about like institutions not sort of over determining who someone is or something like that, uh, I think is a fair point. And at the same time, I think the different influences that people have are just are just endlessly fascinating to me. So I, I appreciate you sharing in some depth, you know, about your background. Um, I'm wondering about, you said that your father had sort of a, an approach of like not wanting to force things on you and really the opposite of that. And I wonder um, if you could speak to your understanding of why he saw things that way and like why he didn't uh, sort of force the martial arts on you as a kid, What, how you think he saw that? Well, um, I think the biggest reason for that was time and place. So when I was really little, like four years old, and they had the school still going, and they had kids' classes, and they were, you know, doing the, the kids' class thing, where you get the uniforms, and you sell the belts, and you pay your rent by effectively babysitting um, at that age. And so... I guess technically I could say, yeah, I did train for a year when I was four or five, but that is, you know, that's, although maybe the storefront school approach, you get eight-year-olds telling you they're black belts, to me that, that doesn't really count. And so when I was of age where it would have been relevant, what was going on at that time and where I was at in my life, the just the time and place didn't match up and you know now I wish it did because you know when I was in high school and I was wanting to play sports or uh, you know screw off with my friends or you know go do graffiti and stuff like that my father was bringing these lineage holder masters from China that had since died that I would have loved to have had access to and loved to be able to you know see and feel what they had going on but by the time that was relevant for me they had already passed away and bringing masters to america was a whole more drawn out process post 9 11. um the other half of that is um you know this is where ultimately we get into what distinguishes internal martial arts, external martial arts, and everything we do. This could tie to Buddhism, it could tie into Taoism, it could tie into effectively however we look at it. Um, so I guess to answer that question at that age, and as kids are prone to being, I didn't have any desire to practice martial arts. And if that isn't there as the first ingredient, then you can't really proceed past that. You can't instill a desire in somebody else very effectively, it turns out. And so even if my dad had forced me to practice from a young age, it probably would have made me a worse martial artist. It probably would have turned me off to it. And me and you probably wouldn't be having this conversation today. The fact that it was actually the opposite. It was like, you know, I'd really have to poke and prod him to get him actually motivated enough to do that. And that was only really, you know, I would only really be capable of that when I was at an age where that's relevant and it's not trying to teach the four-year-old something that, you know, next week he's going to be wanting to do something else because he saw the new Kung Fu Panda movie or something, right? So when we start to analyze desire and, and desire's relationship to movement, you start to touch on what internal arts was kind of trying to answer or trying to address. Um, going back to the basic level of why did my dad not force me to practice or try to instill it in me is, one, he's just not that type of guy. He's just not ever going to be one to try to make people do anything you know his motto and I guess the motto of our school kind of always was if you're interested I'm interested and so nobody and myself included has the interest in becoming the personal trainer that counts your push-ups for you mm -hmm. and if you, if they're not there counting your push-ups you're not going to do the push-ups 
And needless to say, those types of students will never last because there's just an inherent missing ingredient from the get-go. And that ingredient is, a, is effectively the adequate desire to manifest what you're trying to get. Um, so with that said, I didn't really have that desire to learn martial arts until I was, I was about 17, 18, something like that. And my desire at that time was, I'd like to be able to get in a ring with someone and not just get beat up immediately. And that desire being, you know, a, a young adolescent male is pretty common desire. I think most young guys would like to, to not have the worry that someone's just gonna be able to beat them up because at that age, that is kind of when that type of confrontation is, is relevant to some extent. Um, and from that point on, it piqued my interest purely through fighting. And I didn't really have any interest in philosophy. I didn't really have any interest in talking about chi or doing flashy forms. I really wanted to be able to just get in a ring with some kickboxers or some jujitsu guys and, and just be able to not get beat up immediately which at the most basic level is kind of what martial arts is about. And so if we take the martial out, we get a whole other thing. And my initial desire that led me to martial arts was the martial aspect at that time and place. And from that, I was confronted with physical issues in my own body that were preventing me from being able to fight more effectively. And that then forced me to get into theory and philosophy as the well, why, why does this work in the first place? And we need to go back to, like I said prior, you know, hundreds or thousands of years of human development and human time and energy has been spent on some of these arts. And so we kind of have to be genuine or, you know, the, the true empty cup is the common analogy and chew your way through it like a detective. However, that wasn't my desire initially. My initial desire was it would be good to be able to at least feel somewhat comfortable in a physical confrontation. I didn't want to be the UFC champion of the world. I wasn't trying to become, you know, an unbeatable killer or something. It was, it was more basic than that at that time. It was, I had spent no time in that environment. And when you get in that environment without having spent any time there, it's actually kind of a scary place to be. And especially when you get that first taste of the potential for great bodily harm, and you can't do anything about it it's kind of a helpless uh, place to feel like you're in. So that desire is kind of primal to some extent. And honestly, in my personal opinion, I feel like the world would be a better place if everybody addressed that and spent some time in that environment. Because it's not only humbling, because all of a sudden you realize just how fragile you are, especially if the wrong person has got a hold of you in some way. But it's also very liberating because once you finally address that core fundamental issue of the fear of corporeal harm, you become free from it. And when you no longer become so irrationally afraid of physical confrontation because you've never spent any time there, you become free from all of the constraints that show up when you're confronted with a physical altercation. And most people have had no time spent there. And so what you tend to find is someone who's just spent a little bit of time there has an advantage over people who never even want to address that issue. And they have a physical advantage, which in the beginning is the most obvious and the most um, unambiguous. 
But this leads to other advantages of you become free in other aspects of your life as well, because it should empower you. And so, in my opinion, information and knowledge, which really martial arts practices is just trying to give you information that has been handed down, should be liberating. And if it's not liberating, then it's tainted on a fundamental level. This is why I have problems with institutions, especially institutionalized education, largely because today we are in the age of information and institutions no longer have a monopoly on information. And thus they have turned into a monopoly on certification. And this causes some serious problems. So I'll give you an example that in my recent life I've been confronted with. Um, I'm in the process of trying to build a house and I do it all myself from the plumbing to the electric to every Adobe and board. And through this process, there's multiple times I'd hit these roadblocks. One roadblock being you need to have architectural drawings for everything you're gonna to submit to the government, another institution, right? And so for me to play with this institution, they're saying, I gotta have this stamp or have something that meets the, the standard of another institution being the art, uh, the art uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a, a brain fart here. <laughs> being the architects, right? So, uh, Ultimately, what did I have to do? I could not afford to pay an architect because someone that has a stamp from an institution that certifies architects, for me to get that, I got to pay a hell of a lot of money. And so it just financially wasn't an option. Luckily, my state didn't require the architect stamp, but they required drawings that are to the standard of an architect. Well, what do I do? I get on YouTube, I get on a couple websites and I study for three, four months of how to do architectural drawing. Hmm. Well, when I draw not just my house, I had to draw, God, I think it was 400 pages of complete architectural drawings to a standard that an institution says is okay. And they only want to stamp off on someone that's already stamped off by another institution. So when I hand my drawings in and they can't, and I take them to the, the uh, county office here and they look at them and say, great, they can't tell whether an architect drew it or I drew it. And they, it doesn't really matter. And I told them I drew all these and they said, these look great. I've seen architect drawings that look worse than this. Great, stamp it, I'm on my way, right? So we get into a question here of what is this really about? Is this really about the knowledge or is this about some whole other thing? It's about propping up institutions that have in many ways outlived their usefulness and are rapidly being rendered obsolete. And they then have to mutate in order to survive. And we've seen from universities, this was the place of truth, right? This is where we had books and libraries and we had a, a, a whole center of human knowledge that has been accumulated over hundreds of years. Well, now I have all that information on a Google search and I have it probably more up to date than these, a lot of these printed books have, it, right? So why, in everyday society, why can't I now stamp off as an architect? If I've gone through the institution, right? I've met the standard that they set out and all of a sudden it's, it's about a whole other thing. And it's no longer about knowledge being liberating. It's about knowledge being enslaving. And so what happens to the architect who gets that stamp? Well, he's probably racked up a bunch of debt and damn near enslaved himself to these institutions unless he's maybe got some family money or, or is well off to help that. 
he's effectively become enslaved to this system, right? He can't say, oh, great, I'd love to help you out and do it for free, but I can't because I got student loans that I'm barely going to be able to pay off. I got to charge you every penny I can because the system says so. And so everywhere along, you get the excuse, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game. It's like, okay, well, that's not a great answer. And so for me, if knowledge is enslaving, you don't want it. And so I've had interesting conversations with family members who are products of Ivy League education and asked me why I didn't go that route. Why didn't I go to university? And it's a, a version of that same conversation of for me to have gone to university, again, me and you wouldn't be having this conversation right I'd be trying to pay off my student loan debt by whatever institution I have signed on for, be it an architect or be it something else, right? So true knowledge should not have strings attached. And true knowledge should make you able to manifest your personal nature in a higher, less obstructed way. And what you tend to find with institutions, and I will also loop martial arts schools, lineages, and organizations into the same paradigm of, are they going to liberate you and make you more of a free person? Or are they going to ask you to sign on to effectively some level of enslavement? And what you will find is often knowledge is the bait on the hook for some whole other thing. And in martial arts, this is a, is a very common phenomenon where you get these cult-like followings. And when you really analyze what is there is it's effectively a cult wrapped in a pyramid scheme. And they get a personality cult head honcho at the top who they all pay their money up to. And everybody else tries to jockey for where's their position in this cult. And to me, and to when we redid the school, we kind of had a most basic premise of this is not going to be a personality cult. There is no master. There is no style that we are going to be indoctrinated by because we want absolute freedom for everyone, right? And this partially sprang out of, of past historical events. My father has had different masters who he developed relationships with want effectively a group of minions who will do their bidding and who will, usually it comes down to money, who will effectively just pass up all the checks. When you analyze a lot of these big martial arts institutions, that's what you see is it's kind of a pyramid scheme. So you then have to ask yourself, what is the, the core desire of the knowledge they're providing? Is it to really liberate you and to allow you to be a better you or is it to most of the time extract cash from you to pass it on up to the big guy whoever that is and we see this phenomena in religion we see it in probably the best most shining examples are educational institutions um and we definitely see it in martial arts as well and it's a similar kind of tainted uh version of something that they're offering which is not genuine or it's it's got a lot of strings attached and um so you know i think to some extent when we go back to the saint john's question is you get these a lot of what they teach should be liberating and it you know a lot of the philosophy and a lot of the, the archetype of people that go there are definitely, in my opinion, uh, geared towards that. And institutions in the current climate, you can't function without running that game. And so I came into the same problem with my Kung Fu school is how can I pay my rent, keep the lights on, 
and give people stuff that they find difficult and unpleasant. And to do that genuinely, I can't be the personal trainer. I can't artificially instill a desire in you to do your push-ups. I can only offer you my understanding of push-ups and then give you the freedom to go off and make it yours, right? And so that's very difficult business model because when you try to liberate people through what you teach, they all go away to some extent, or they're not going to be there faithfully paying you money every month. And they're not going to be uh, paying you for belts every couple months and certifications and uniforms and plastic gear and equipment. It's not a good business model. So a big part of why we stopped or why I stopped teaching as my profession was it was no longer beneficial to me as a student. And so if I jump back a little bit, in 2008, the housing market crashed and I was doing construction at the time. And I was teaching at the school, you know, as much as I could doing construction. And then one day I was out of a job. And that forced me to go full time to teaching. And I did that for almost 10 years, I think. And at that time, teaching for me was very selfish. I mean, yes, it was my profession, but I didn't get, I wasn't making, I wasn't getting rich off of it. So if I was wanting to make money, there were many other jobs I could do to make better money. But it was relevant for my practice because every student I had equally taught me something. There were different body types, different personalities, different motivations, and those case studies were pretty important for me at that time. After 10 years of that, I, it wasn't as relevant for me. And I came to the conclusion I needed to go find high level people, people that are not beginners that I'm teaching basic stuff to. I need higher level case studies to observe and to go try to find out. That was my inspiration for going to China to try to see who all I could drum up and what, what, uh, what all was out there. To. Um, at that time, the school was relatively steady. You know, We had our steady group of students and we were paying the rent. No one was getting rich, but we had a location of practice and everyone was able to, to do their deal. Um, after I came back from China, Needless to say, I wasn't going to just jump back into the teaching as a profession game. Although maybe I could have tried that, it would have been, it would have killed my soul to try to run the storefront karate school, kung fu school, sell uh, soccer moms into black belt contracts for ridiculous amounts of money and pay my rent quite easily there. But effectively, I'm a babysitter at that point. So when we shut down the school again, it was about, you know, the school started organically and it ended organically. And in many ways, the school was again, the vehicle, not the destination. And so where that led me now is it, it led me to be more free. I don't have to teach seven-year-old forms to pay the rent anymore. I know the seven-year-old next week, he's going to want to play soccer and he ain't going to care two craps about this form, but the mother's check still clears, so I better be there to do it every week. And that was really not what I was wanting to do any longer. I had my fill of that. Um, so today, now I'm kind of free to pick and choose what students and where I spend my time in it. Because, you know, to, to take the motto, if you're interested, I'm interested. If you run a school, you kind of have to be catering to people who aren't really interested. And um, then it's your job to make them interested, which turns out you just can't really do effectively. And uh, so although I didn't go to university, I saw a lot of those same 
traps with my friends who went to university. And a lot of them today are not free from that. They're bogged down with student loan debt and they have effectively become, you know, a lot of them slaves for the rest of their life. A lot of them, I don't think they're going to ever pay off the student loan debt they've accrued unless it gets canceled somehow. So then I have to ask myself, well, how is that really going to uh, allow a student to unfold their destiny? It's a whole other thing. And you tend to see institutions have to make themselves relevant to some extent. And they do that in our modern day, not through withholding information, because the cat's out of the bag. The information's out there if you want it. Now they do it through withholding certification and then relying on other institutions to stifle you unless you have that certification. Um, and, you know, we're in the age of information. So if you really want it, if the desire is there enough, there's nothing holding you back. And that was kind of what I found with the architectural drawings was I really wanted to get all this certified and I wanted it bad enough that I was going to chew through everything required to satisfy this institution, which in my personal experience, I don't really see a whole lot of these institutions helping us as much as throwing roadblocks down and in many ways extorting financial <laughs> contributions and bribes to effectively to do stuff that is it's all out there if you want it bad enough um, so i don't know if that went off on a tangent for you but that's kind of my rant on that mm -hmm. i liked it uh can you say what practices of martial arts you studied and practiced before you went to china and then what you studied and practiced after going to china yeah, I first started, and you know, I guess I kind of had a lot of stuff thrown at me, but I first started with a style of, I guess it's technically Taekwondo, and there's different types of Taekwondo, but this was Jido Kwan Taekwondo, and the distinction of this style is it's a soft style, and I guess there's a longer conversation into some of the common distinctions we come across, but I guess we could generally say that it's not technically internal because we haven't really tried to focus on the process which precedes visual movement. Through this style, we've just focused on repetition of movement to train our, our body and our nervous system. And that's where our focus is on do the movement and do it enough to where it just downloads into your body over time. It's a soft style in the sense that it's trying to make relaxed whole body power. And so if you look at like a traditionally hard style, like say Okinawan karate, they're very rigid, they're very robotic. Their movements are very kind of stiff and forceful. And these styles tend to really train isolated movement, where this first style of Jido Kwan I learned was almost more like, almost more like soccer or something or playing basketball. You're trying to stay in a relaxed, springy, loose, uh, not floppy and weak, but not rigid and stiff. And so with this first style, it, it forces you to understand basic body mechanics and how to get your whole body involved in creation of just basic power. And in the beginning, it's all just striking. And it's so, you know, striking is relatively simplistic in theory. You just ram your body part into something with enough force to cause damage how you create the force, what parts of your body you hit with all of that, there's a lot of nuance, but compared to joint locking and choking, striking is relatively simplistic. You're just trying to hit them. But when you truly analyze how to use your body efficiently, it turns out there's a lot going on. 
And so it was kind of in that first style where I, I was confronted with all my physical issues. First and foremost, I had horrible flat feet from my whole childhood up to when I practiced. And so needless to say, this would affect my ability to spring and jump and hop and do all the springy movement that's required. And after I'd train in the beginning, my feet would just kill me. And it was so obvious that my feet were not functioning correctly that I could not ignore it. I had to ultimately address it. And that was a big part of, of kind of trying to disassemble your own body, analyze everything, and then re-put it all back together again after you've identified where the messed up pieces are. Um, so from trying to just get good whole body power where I could hit a heavy bag with unambiguous force, I was confronted with these issues, which then in order to address them, I kind of was directed towards the theory that led me to more of the internal arts stuff. Initially, I didn't really care about theory. I didn't want to talk about it. It wasn't very interesting to me. After understanding this is kind of where the key to my own physical issues resided, I then started to focus more on theory. And from that point forward, theory started to take more of a role than just making power and hitting things, which in my personal opinion, you need to start there. You need to be able to hit something with unambiguous force that anybody can see, wow, that's, that's forceful. Then we can start to have the more subtle conversations that internal arts tend to get overly focused on in many conversations you hear on the topic. Um, after I started to address some of my physical issues, I started to see the results of that. This was kind of the carrot at the end of the stick that led me to want to do more of that. And uh, then teaching people, I was then confronted with students' physical issues. And then after seeing every assortment of people's different body types and past trauma and just uh, the way they inhabit their bodies, you kind of start to get a more well-rounded picture of how these dynamics are supposed to work. Um, I guess if we, if we get into the what makes something internal versus external, this is where you get less of a consensus and a lot of different ideas on the topic. Um, I have my understanding and the conclusions I came to, and you will hear every different variation or, or idea on the topic. Um, however, if we're gonna briefly touch on what makes something internal versus external, we have to get into some of the basic theory that Chinese martial arts has encoded their styles with. So after I started learning some Jido Kwan, which is a, a Korean derived style, I started doing more uh, Wu style Tai Chi Chuan and uh, Hebei style Xingyi, Xingyi Chuan, which is a hard internal martial art. And, uh, I started doing some basic circle walking from Bhagavad Gita. Um, and these are a little more subtle than the, the first Jido Kwan style, where we're just trying to create unambiguous whole body power. The forms are a little more abstract. There's a lot more theory involved. There was, everything's happening much slower, which was something that in dynamic styles, you don't do a lot of stuff super slow like you do in Taiji or Shingi. Uh, standing practices started to really get emphasized. And initially, the Jido Kwan style is a dynamic center style. So in many ways, this style requires you to be constantly springing or having the potential to make your center dynamic and springing off of the earth. Whereas, at least it starts with dynamic center. Whereas Taiji, Shinyi, and, and Bagua as well tend to emphasize rooted center first. 
So you get a lot of standing practices, which focus on not how do you spring off of the earth, but how do you actually connect to the earth? These two are two halves. You, you ultimately need both of them to function, but generally internal arts emphasize the rooted aspect in the beginning more than the dynamic aspect. You see this with forms being practiced slow in the beginning and not as obvious releases of force as you do in external dynamic styles. Um, what makes it internal becomes, I guess we kind of have to go back to some of the theory, which generally they look at as internal arts are comprised of Taiji Chuan, Shimi Chuan, Bagua Chuan. They will also say some styles like Liu Ho Bafa would be an internal, and some will say Wing Chun and some Shaolin have internal training methods or concepts or ideas. In all reality, they were all cross-pollinating with each other and interacting with each other. So a lot of these concepts you find are broadly uh, present in Asian martial arts, jujitsu as well. Um, tends to go back to these basic concepts which come out of the E. Jing five element theory. Um, but generally what you hear with internal styles is an emphasis on what they refer to as the six harmonies. And the six harmonies, we have three internal harmonies and three external harmonies. In many ways, we could say internal arts masters asked the question, where does movement originate? So if I was to ask you this question, how would you answer? Where does movement start? What is the first spark that is responsible for moving our body? It's the answer that comes to mind is intention. Okay, can you elaborate? I think phenomenologically, sometimes I respond automatically to something, it seems um, like, uh, I don't know, I don't actually get the startle reflex very much. But for example, if a big noise happened, I might startle, for example. Um, so that seems somewhat reactive. But a lot of the time, it seems like I have uh, Sometimes it'll be a visual image and I'll want to move, but then there's sort of, it seems like there's cognition that's not visual or auditory, but that's happening anywhere where it's like, oh, I would like to like pick up my water bottle, for example, and there's some internal intention to do that, uh, that okay. might be visual, but might not be. Well, that's a good, okay, we could use that as an analogy for what we mean by the three internal harmonies, right? You didn't just pick up your water bottle, right? You didn't just decide out of nowhere, I'm going to pick up this water bottle. You had a thirst, a need or a desire, which preceded the whole conscious concept of water in the bottle, therefore I'm going to pick it up, right? Hmm. So the way that the three internal harmonies kind of look at this is if we're going to go back to what is the originating spark that is responsible for all the physiological processes which create movement. In this case, grabbing your water bottle to take a drink. Well, we could say reasonably, you were thirsty, therefore you had a desire or a need which preceded any conscious intent or focusing on the water bottle, right? Mm -hmm. So in the three internal harmonies, the first one you tend to hear them refer to as shin, which translates to our heart mind, which tends to be our need or our desire for things. So, you know, the other analogy could be I have a scratch on my head. Well, I have the desire or the need to scratch it, 
that precedes any picking of my arm up to actually scratch my head, right? So they tend to say, if we're gonna analyze where movement starts, it's the need or the desire to move in the first place. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the need and what is the desired movement if we're looking at it in relationship to movement? So let's just say uh, we look at a punch, which is pretty common to all martial arts. Before any of the physiological process occurs for me to punch, I first had the idea, I want to hit this thing or I need to hit this thing. I had a need or desire, which is the originating factor for punching something. Why is my desire to hit it? Well, maybe I don't wanna get beat up, which is a pretty primal need or desire, or maybe I'm pissed off and I wanna hurt this thing, which again is a pretty basic need or desire. So the first harmony that they tend to look at is how do we harmonize our initial need or our desire with our conscious intent. So now if we use the water bottle analogy, you said, I'm thirsty, I wanna drink some water. There's the need or the desire which started the process of movement. There's then a part of your brain or nervous system that says, what do I need to do to actualize this desire? And so in Chinese martial arts, they refer to this as the, the yi, the intent. If we have disharmony between the need and how do we actually manifest that need, it's going to show up in our movement as disjointed or movement that isn't correct. We didn't actualize the movement, even though we desired to. In other words, maybe I desire to juggle, but my conscious intent is not trained to, to able to do that. Right. Or I desire to play the guitar, but if I've never played the guitar, it doesn't mean that my conscious intent is able to actualize this desire. So that's the first harmony that we look at is the heart, mind and the intent. Second harmony is, well, now the intent is going to say, OK, I know what we're desiring to do. Now I need to send the appropriate signals to the correct places to manifest this movement. So to use the water bottle analogy, you said, okay, I know I'm thirsty. I know the water's in the bottle. Now I need to consciously direct my arm to grab that water bottle so I can take a drink. So the next one is the conscious intent and chi have to harmonize. And when we get into the, the word chi, this is, uh, opens up a can of worms <laughs> because a lot of things are looped into chi to explain phenomena that's not entirely understood. Uh, it's chi. But in this context, I would say the most appropriate explanation is the medium with which our conscious intent controls our body. And so Western science would agree with this. We're sending electrical energies through our nervous system to get the right muscle groups to grab the water bottle, to create a force contrary to gravity, to pick it up and take a drink. So we need our conscious intent and energy to link with each other. And so then the last harmony is chi and li or strength or force have to now harmonize. So the water bottle analogy, you had the desire to take a drink, your intent sends energy to the right parts of your arm to go and grab the water bottle. And when there's adequate energy to move your body contrary to gravity, we see a force occur, which in this case is maybe just the force contrary to gravity to pick up your water bottle. And so, Internal arts look at the six harmonies and the three internal harmonies as being where movement starts. So if we can start to focus from where movement starts, we can get better movement out the other side. External martial arts have focused on the lead, the force. 
So the first style I learned, it didn't talk about chi, it didn't talk about intent, there was none of that. It was do movement and create force until this becomes trained and you don't think about it anymore. My focus is not on desire, it's not on intent, it's just do the movement and do it enough until it's ingrained. Internal arts start to say, well, if we can focus from the inside out or focus from the desire to direct our intent to energy to create a, a force, we can harmonize this process more efficiently than we can by just repetition alone. So external styles, you tend to see, you just do it a bunch and you do it and you do it and you do it and you do it until you've just programmed your chi, you programmed your conscious intent and the desire is what brought you to the gym in the first place to kick the heavy bag around, right? So internal arts have said, well, there's a better way to do this than just repetition alone. And internal arts masters were external martial artists first. So it's like they went down the external road and came to the conclusion there's a better way. And that's how internal martial arts kind of got developed. And it was looked at as like the pinnacle of Chinese martial arts like the product of all the evolution of external martial arts has led us to internal martial arts was the idea. However, in our modern day, it's mutated to something other than that to some extent. But if we go back to the force component, a lot of people want to say internal force is different than external force. I personally don't agree with this. The force or the Lee component or what the person feels when you punch them, they're not going to, it's not going to be different internal or external. There might be different body mechanics involved in how we create the force. But fundamentally, we're talking about unambiguous force. As we progress from there, we can get more subtle through cause and effect relationships from rudimentary force of usually hitting things or not getting pushed over by people. Um, the three external harmonies are a product of the three internal harmonies. So the idea is, depending on how those three internal harmonies work together, they will produce external harmonies or they won't. And the external harmonies are the hands harmonized with the feet, the elbows harmonize with the knees and the shoulders harmonize with the hips. These are the things we can analyze through a form or through movement. That's why they're external. You could see them on a photograph or a video. You can't see someone's desire. You can't see someone's intent or their chi. You can't even really see force, but you can see how the hands and feet move in space. You can analyze how the elbows and knees and shoulders and hips are moving, because this is like the body mechanics half of it. But we have to harmonize those two. And so internal arts are interesting in the way in which they practice, because their training methods develop differently than external martial arts, with this as the core idea of we want to train the internal process, which is invisible, but is directly responsible for visual external movement. Mm. If that makes sense. It does, yes. Can you describe how you um, worked out what was happening with your physical issues and how you solved them? Well, the physical issues are ultimately a force, right? So to use the analogy of, or to use the example of my flat feet when I first started was the first alarm that went off was pain. After I'd practiced, my feet would hurt. They'd be sore. I could feel they just weren't happy. That we could say in many ways, pain is the body's way of getting you to direct intent to something that's not right. 
So my feet hurting, initially, I didn't know why. And even before I started practicing, when I did football, basketball, I'd still have sore feet because my arches weren't functioning. The difference was pre-practice, I'd just ignore it or try to get an orthotic and not have my intent figure out why does this hurt? The body's trying to tell me something here. When I started practicing and the desire to fix my feet was adequate to the amount of work required to do that, I started to pick out how my feet weren't holding force correctly. And it's pretty obvious with collapsed arches because we can see visually the bones crashing down to come in contact with the floor in the keystone of what should be the arch of your foot. So I would notice this, like I'd get out of the shower and my footprint on the shower floor would be just a blob. And then you'd see the toes at the end because there's no functioning arch. So the whole sole of the foot has become a pancake. And it doesn't work this way. Evolution has not made our feet function this way. Largely, I blame shoes. And ironically, uh, a chiropractor when I was a kid, they put me on orthotics mm. when I was pretty young, mm. which orthotics, in my opinion, if, you, if you're going to resign yourself to the problem and make no attempt to fix it, then maybe orthotics are better than no orthotics. But orthotics filled not very well, but they kind of filled the role the arch should be doing. Thus, never making your body have to wake your feet up and actually fulfill that role for itself. So as I started training more martial arts, I got rid of my old thick soled shoes, the basketball shoes I'd always wear, or skating shoes that were really thick rubber, not very bendable soles. And they have big artificial arch supports in them. I started to get rid of those shoes. I started to really focus on my feet and started to, through a, a feeling, your body tells you what needs to happen if you listen and you train long enough. I literally started to feel where my feet and bones had to move around. And after a while, it, you know, I think it took me probably four or five years I started to develop arches again. And I would notice again by the footprint when my feet were wet. All of a sudden, I'd have like a true footprint where you see the arch is not in contact with the ground anymore. And so when we start to analyze the force or the load bearing surface area in the feet, we start to now have a force that we can run six harmonies on, right? So if we look at how did I fix my feet, well, what was the first thing ingredient I had to have? Had to have the desire to do it. If I didn't have the desire to fix my feet, I'm never gonna do the practice required to do it. So the desire's gotta be present. And that's where I say, I, you can't artificially give that to someone. My father couldn't artificially give me the desire to practice. I can't artificially give that desire to you. And if I had a, storefront school, you're kind of asked to do that. You have to keep people entertained and keep them coming back, but it's, it's not genuine to the process. So when my desire to fix my feet was adequate, then I had to actually do it, which meant direct my conscious intent as to how my feet are not working right. And I did that through doing Kung Fu. That is the practice effectively through doing forms, through trying to reach certain standards of stuff, you're confronted with your physical issues. When you pull on that string, it leads you to your desire. Well, why were my feet problematic? There's a lot of reasons, but it ultimately boils down to how I lived my life up to that point, which is ultimately a, a byproduct of all my desires that have made me live my life the way I live. Same for you. So everybody has built a body based around the way they live their life. When you analyze why you live your life the way you live your life, desire tends to, again, come back to be that most fundamental ingredient as to both good and bad, why you are the person you are on the most fundamental level. So we could also look at, you know, Buddhism's way of trying to address this through 
the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. It's trying to give us a similar understanding of our reality changes depending on how we interact with it through our desires. And if we become shameless, uh, you know, if we just shamelessly indulge our desires, it effectively increases our attachment and therefore suffering to some extent. Well, martial arts kind of almost forces you the other way, where the suffering of your feet hurting is what liberates you through that. And so after years of my feet hurting and me kind of having to suffer through it, the pain would change from my feet being not functioning right to my the pain of your feet being conditioned. And it's a radically different type of pain. And then after years of that, all of a sudden I noticed, wow, I'm doing stuff that before my feet would be killing me. Now I don't get any pain. Um, when I had flat feet, I would get ingrown toenails chronically because the arch doesn't function and all the toes become sandwiched together like a big flipper paddle almost. And all your toes become crunched. And this would always mess up the way your toes grow. And so when you pull on that string, slowly it leads you through your whole body. And the idea is martial arts should effectively kind of take you apart and rebuild you back together again in a very physical sense. But what does that is those three internal harmonies. And this happens whether we are consciously aware of it or not, in my opinion. It's, in my opinion, it's not like we do internal martial arts and external martial arts. These are training methods and external martial arts they train these internal processes. They just do it unconsciously. They're not aware that this is happening because they focus on the movement. Internal martial arts are consciously trying to address the internal harmonies and how they manifest movement. Um, you will get a lot of different takes on this. This is my personal take. And that when an internal martial artist punches you or an external martial artist punches you, you're just going to feel like you got punched. We could analyze how they use isolated muscle groups or different physiological ways they use their body, but that's external. If we can see it and we can visually analyze it, we're not talking about internal. So even that argument of internal arts guys hit you different because maybe they hit you with more of their body. Well, yeah, okay, but that's not internal. That's still external we're talking about. So the idea of internal is things, it's not visual. This is stuff that is you, you find in yourself and then you pick it apart in other people. So desire is an interesting one. Intent is an interesting one. Energy or chi is a very interesting one because in the process of doing this, you get all kinds of different physiological uh, hallucinations and sensations and numbness, tingling, every different kind of thing happens. But for me and you to talk about it, where we can have a realm of cause and effect relationships that's meaningful, me and you can only talk about the force because I can't see or, or uh, understand your chi. I can't see your intent. I can't see your desire. The only thread I get to your internal condition is through your lead, through the force that you create. And that will give me a clue. But if we can see it or visually analyze it, we're talking about the three external harmonies or the way the, move, the visual movement of the body is happening. But it doesn't start there is the idea. It starts on something that's invisible, it's internal. There is no physiological process we can see for the three internal organs. You mentioned Buddhism and earlier, I think you mentioned Taoism as well and these sort of Chinese philosophies. I know uh, in your TED talk, you quoted Confucius as well. And um, I wonder, how you think about these philosophies and religions and spiritual practices and how you see them at this point in your life. 
Well, I guess uh, my TED talk was geared towards the Chinese audience. I was actually, it was kind of a funny experience. I wasn't exactly sure what to expect when I did that. I did that while I was in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in some ways, if it was for a Western audience, I may have changed it differently. I probably wouldn't have repeated myself so much or talked as slow as I did, but, you know, bear that in mind. Everyone who was there was Chinese that was listening to me mm -hmm. um, at one of the universities. Um, well, I guess I would say Buddhism and Taoism to me are in many ways saying the same thing. Confucianism is a whole, a whole nother thing in itself in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to give the historical understanding or why that's the case. But from my general understanding is, you know, Confucius coming out of the Warring States period when life was chaotic and they knew nothing but warfare, the rigid structure that Confucianism provided was very appealing because it created some kind of harmony and structure out of a climate that was chaos. With that said, everything in Confucianism doesn't really apply to martial arts quite the same as Taoism and Buddhism to some extent as well, although not as directly. Um, so I, you know, in some ways, I guess I'd leave Confucianism off. The, the reason I brought that up in my TED talk was I wanted the audience to have a connection to the concept that I was trying to express in that, which was really bridging the gap between the theory of something and the functionality of it. And so the Confucian quote, along with the Einstein quote, kind of they fit that. Um, in the context of martial arts, I don't find so much in Confucius that is of use. Um, now, if we go to Taoism and Buddhism, and the reason I say many, in many ways they're saying the same thing is, well, let's start with the I Ching and Taoism. Um, if we look at the process of change laid out in the I Ching, and we start with this concept of Wu Ji or no duality or no polarization, it's a pre-yin or yang condition, which gives birth to Taiji, which everyone knows is the yin yang symbol, the black and white fish together in the circle. Taiji, the direct translation is extreme polarization or extreme limits. It's the birth of duality. But they're not yet separate energies from each other, which is why they're in one circle. We'll also refer to it as the one chi. Yin and yang are, there's the potential for polarization, but it hasn't yet occurred. The next condition in the aging is liang yi, which translates to like the two appearances or the two forms. Black and white fish have swam apart from each other. We got a solid line and a broken line, and we've shown yin and yang as two separate energies. From this point on, we then have different combinations of solid and broken lines stacked on top of each other. We then get uh, two solid, a broken, a solid, a solid, a broken, two broken. And the idea with the aging is from this point on, everything is yin and yang combinations. And they stop expressing this with 64 hexagrams. Now, in martial arts, Taiji, Shini, Bagua, they all use the I Ching as a framework to encode the forms and the styles to the I Ching and the five elements, which are in some ways saying the same thing. Um, if we are to look at the Buddhist approach, so in other words, the, the Taoist approach is saying yin yang, we're not saying good or bad, we're just saying they're different and they contextualize each other and that uh, mutual opposition, they're dependent on each other. If we look at the core fundamental idea with Buddhism is, you know, and again, in, in my understanding, we could reduce it to 
the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, which um, if we look at attachment and desire, we could go back to the same Taoist framework of yin and yang. So if I was to think about a child in the womb, they're in a, a wuji state to some extent. They don't know any temperature change. They just get what their mother feeds and they have no real yin or yang understanding yet. Then the second they're born, they're going from 98.6 degrees their whole life to room temperature. And they get what would probably perceptually feel like you're landing in a ice water or something for the very first time. And they've got a fundamental anchor point of reality, which is cold. From that day forward, the infant is experiencing different anchor points from hot and cold to night and day, from all the flavors. And from that day forward, the child's universe is getting larger and larger based upon these extreme anchor points that they've experienced. So although I have no recollection of being born and, and having room temperature being felt for the first time, Cold and temperature is such a fundamental polar extreme to our existence that everybody has a desire to be a comfortable temperature, generally. When I went to China, I was living in a city that had minus 30 winters, and they would make an ice city. And so I'd never experienced cold like this before. 30 some years later, my universe just got a little bit bigger hadn't really grown since my day of birth, really. All of a sudden, I can now say I've experienced minus 30 Celsius. And it's something that is so fundamental to our understanding of our reality, but yet we don't really think about it. So if we're really going to analyze desire in the way that Buddhism does, we're really just talking about yin-yang, right? You're really just talking about you prefer one thing over another. Some people prefer a hot room, some people prefer a cold room, but the idea is you're just making a preference towards yin or yang or some combination thereof. The I Ching doesn't look at this in how you live your life the same way Buddhism does. The I Ching lays this pattern out and says, this is the universal code of nature effectively, which is pretty, good argument considering the I Ching first came up with a binary code and every computer today is speaking through the I Ching pattern effectively. So the I Ching is kind of like a basic framework that says the universe unfolds through this pattern. And our understanding of attachment and desire is directly connected to our understanding of a Taiji condition or understanding yin yang opposites. So if we look at the, the, the next step in Buddhism, so after the Four Noble Truths, we get the Eightfold Path, which is effectively trying to get you to look at desire's role and its role in attaching you through your food choices, through the way you speak, effectively through the way you interact with your environment. Either you're steering towards your desire and thus increasing attachment and suffering, or you're not. In the I Ching, I guess they don't look at it so much as good and bad and not so moral as maybe shows up in Buddhism of, of uh, it being almost a moral attribute to behave this way. Whereas the I Ching is almost looking at it like this is trying to understand the fundamental makeup of our reality and attachment and desire are just part of that fundamental makeup of our reality. And so we can draw endless correlations between yin yang relationships. Buddhism is interesting because it, it looks at how you live your life and how you increase your, not just suffering, but I would argue your one point of perspective that that anchoring or attachment gives you. 
So in other words, probably if you ask someone, do you want to go experience minus 35 winters? Most people would say, oh, that doesn't sound very good. Because we have a desire towards one extreme. But yet, after experiencing that, your universe, your experiential reality is now larger. And uh, this is fundamental to our understanding of our reality. We could get to the, the question which they're still trying to answer is, is matter or consciousness fundamental or is one fundamental to the other? Our whole reality radically changes depending on what we attribute as being fundamental to the other. I guess the I Ching looks at the two are mutually creating each other. The way that martial arts have used the I Ching is quite interesting because they've taken this largely philosophical framework and they've encoded a martial arts uh, tradition to it. And the idea that martial arts are pretty black or white, you either going to live or you're going to die in, in a lot of the social climates where you were relying on your martial arts. So the idea that they saw this philosophy and this theory and they were able to use it to create something that had real valuable in the form of a functional martial art is pretty amazing. It gives you a black or white uh, relationship to a theory which gets quite abstract. It's Chinese medicine, feng shui, they're all going to be starting to use these same philosophical frameworks, but in radically different ways. Farming, all of this is trying to encode through the EJ and by the way theory. But martial arts are interesting because they say, I got all this philosophy and I made it work to where, okay, let's fight each other. And I'm going to make it work unambiguously in the realm of physical confrontation, or that is the goal. So for me, that was what was appealing to it to some extent, or that's how it, I was led to it. Because if it was just talking about the EJ, I'd have glazed over and fallen asleep very quickly. If it was the key to make me fight better, then it got my attention initially. But that was the thread that leads you to all kinds of interesting stuff. You kind of go down the rabbit hole that is teaching and Taoism and Buddhism for that matter as well. Do you identify as either a Buddhist or a Taoist or they, or no? no. And honestly, I don't really think you can identify as either of those. Hmm. In my personal opinion, <clears throat> if you are identifying with one and you're missing the picture, hmm. is, you know, this is trying to take you apart on a fundamental level. So when you're looking at the aging and you're practicing and you're running this process on yourself, you should feel... These don't become adornments to your personality. They pick your personality apart to where you are confronted on a fundamental level of who you are to some extent. And therefore, those distinctions are absolutely meaningless because me identifying as anything is really irrelevant to what we're talking about. What's important is understanding how this is fundamental to everything. This is about understanding your relationship to reality and the universe as whole, not saying I am a one of these. And that in many ways is the institutionalization of things of, you know, and martial arts is big with this. And I have this with students who, you know, or, or people have done one class with me. And then I hear through the grapevine, they tell everyone, oh yeah, I practice with so-and-so and I do this. It's like, this has become a, uh, a, uh, something else when when our personal identification gets wrapped up in it if anything this should undo all of that and bring you to truth which is the fundamental understanding of our reality and martial arts just being one expression of that what's so interesting about these theories when you you know kind of go down the rabbit hole is it leads to everything. So these theories used for gardening, nothing having to do with martial arts, but they should hold true for gardening. That's probably where the, a lot of these theories sprung from was 
when agricultural societies first started when some of these concepts were looked at. Um, Chinese medicines using all of the, the way the meridians are laid out and acupuncture points, all of this goes back to this, this basic philosophy and theory. So when you ask yourself the fundamental question, who am I? We go to the consciousness matter conundrum. What is fundamental? Is it matter or is it consciousness? And in my opinion, the way the I Ching looks at this is you as a person is a product of a Taiji condition. In other words, you are distinguishing yourself from everything else, where the Wuji condition is no yin or yang. It's, you know, sometimes old translate like the void. It's a condition that me or you can't entirely conceptually understand because we are fundamentally stuck to a Taiji condition of yin or yang. Me and you are still stuck to hot, cold, and all the opposite uh, characteristics of our reality, right? When you get into some of the meditative aspects and some of the quantum physics as well, and you start to ask the question of what is fundamental matter or consciousness, that, that question is not answered really. Um, but the way the I Ching looks at this, or the way the Taiji answers this is in stillness, yin and yang combine. In movement, they polarize and they separate. When yin and yang combine through stillness, the distinction between the two is gone and there's no distinction. And we leave a Taiji condition and we enter a Wuji condition. What this means in a physical practice sense is we are trying to undo our habitual garbage from everyday life. What this means in a, a philosophical sense becomes even more of a longer conversation, I guess. Um, but so why I say I don't identify as a Taoist or a Buddhist is that's kind of missing the question to some extent or directing your focus to something that's not really critical. What's, what's more of a, of a relevant question would be asking yourself more the question of like, who am I? as opposed to I'm a one of these. And what you will feel is all of a sudden, in the same way I said information can enslave you, the same type of thing can happen. This should pick you apart and free you from those constraints of I am a one of these or a one of those. And when you're not thinking that way, you will be more present to observing what is there. In the beginning, this is all physical stuff. Like in our class, I'd have you push on me or, you know, it wasn't theoretical. It was something you should feel the lead, the force aspect of it, which then directs you to the internal process. But the general goal is, as we become more balanced physically, mentally, emotionally, we get closer and closer to a Wuji condition. And in, in martial arts, you tend to hear that's where all the, the interesting aspects come from is it's almost like factory reset that undoes us of all of our habitual garbage we've developed. At least that's the goal to some extent. You said that when you first started getting interested in the martial arts, your main intention was to be able to, you know, stay in the ring for a bit as it were. And then, you know, later on it became about, um, reckoning with the pain that you were feeling in your feet and understanding that what would you say motivates you in your own practice now um well i would think i guess like all art you you know they say art is never finished it's only abandoned hmm. and i do find especially when you're talking about your own body it's pretty interesting to have stuff exposed to you that you've been present to your whole life, but been completely oblivious to. 
And then uh, as that process happens, and I won't say this happens for everybody, but further enough down the road, it's, it's more like you couldn't not practice to some extent, or even if you're not practicing, you are practicing. Like this process starts and if you keep it going, it, it's kind of a self-informative process that happens. So currently, unfortunately, the majority of the time I practice is with students because everyday life, building a house, trying to do all the stuff I'm doing leaves very little time for practice. Um, if I was to analyze why did I want to build the house and why did I want to do all that, the goal of that was so I could practice more ultimately. A big part of going to China was, wow, it would be nice to drop all my everyday life stuff and be able to just take yourself out of your environment and focus on something. Um, at a certain point when I started working more, that was less possible in China. Um, so I wouldn't say there's one reason I practice today. It's definitely not just a fight like it originally was although I still enjoy that and I like getting students who do that because it's still fun for me. Um, I think it's more now just trying to kind of dig, dig the hole deeper, you know, get further and further down something you've started. And uh, I guess that is ultimately a desire question too, because, you know, there's a lot of students at the school who they burnt out after a couple of years and you can see you get confronted with issues and you have to ask yourself, do I want this bad enough to solve this problem or do I not? And often people, when they get confronted with that, they say, you know, I understand what I need to do to fix these issues, but I don't want it bad enough. So I'm just gonna, and that there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, in many ways coming to that conclusion earlier is better. If you're true with yourself as to what is your desire, you won't fall into the personal trainer trap of if you don't have someone yelling at you, you're not going to practice. And that's just not a recipe for success, really. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, I guess the other aspect of that is when you're when you inhabit your body with more clarity everything you do kind of becomes practice and that becomes interesting in and in of itself. So, you know, I've often told students, some of my best Kung Fu practice is fly fishing. Hmm. And why is that? Well, try to out trick the nervous system of some of these fish in nature. Hmm. Their nervous systems are home to nature because if they're off for an instant, they're somebody's lunch, right? So now try to you and your nervous system, try to tangle with their nervous system and it's Kung Fu practice. Um, and needless to say, the fish wins nine times out of 10 most of the time. Um, so the more you do it and the more this process starts to happen, it bleeds over into everything you do. And then the line of practice, not practice is not so obvious as it was in the beginning. Because, you know, standing in the grocery store line starts to become practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you work with students now um well first it sounds like you don't run a school now is that right not anymore no yeah so you just so sort of informally much one -on -one with people. Or just yeah just people who like you fall out of the sky and show up out of the woodwork yes yes uh cam for that matter <laughs> that's right um well so when when people fall out of the sky how do you tend to work with them? And um, yeah, how do you tend to work with your students? Well, I guess it depends why they're wanting to practice in the first place. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes to, to gauging their desire and interest level. So, you know, I'm very much like my dad and if you're interested, I'm interested. Um, and because I don't need to worry about paying rent anymore by teaching, I can, tell people to fuck off if I want, which <laughs> happened, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't want to be, I guess the way one, one teacher would say is in the beginning, the students run off of your engine. It's like, you kind of jumpstart their engine, but I don't want to be jumpstarting their engine every single practice. It's like, do that in the beginning. Okay. But at some point they, they take it on for themselves. And if they don't, then you kind of have to ask yourself, why are they doing this? And are they genuinely here for what they want? 
Um, often people, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You try it, you find something you want or you don't. But very quickly on, you're going to be confronted with all of your problems. And most people, they don't want to be confronted with their issues. So the first stage is the most bitter. Then after that, students that make it through the first stage, then it's you get a little more of the carrot, less of the stick. Um, but as far as new students, I just, you know, they show up, I see what they're trying to get, what they're into. And usually I try to antidote. I usually try to give them what they don't want to some extent. Usually if they come wanting something, it's a red flag <laughs> to some extent, depending on what they want. Or if they come and they're overly enthusiastic, usually that's a red flag because usually those sites just burn out right away. Mm. Really psyched, I'm going to practice every single day. And then it's like, you're never going to. Mm. It's the, the tortoise, not the hare. Um, so, you know, if I get students that are more like they want to do qigong and they want to do feeling their body, usually I'm going to be trying to gear them into fighting eventually. And the ones that want to just come to fight, I'm going to be gearing them to want to do standing and, and so that there's a little bit of a balancing of, the, of whatever their inclinations are. But arguably, the process kind of works itself. And so after the students have been doing it for a little while, it's kind of a self-informative process if you train it as such. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I think we had some, some conversations when you did the class about this is not yoga. This is a martial art in the sense that a good martial art is not ambiguous or an effective one, is it, right? Or at least traditionally it wasn't. Bad martial arts died on the battlefield and it was pretty black or white off. Today, for the most part, it's the same case. Two people fight, you're gonna pretty obviously have an outcome that is unambiguous. So that is an important realm to stay in because it's obvious cause and effect relationships and there's no smoke being blown, it's unambiguous. Then from there, you can get to the more abstract stuff and have it be meaningful. But if we start with just abstract stuff and Qigong and all of that, we don't really have a cause and effect arena to test it and to come to find truth together with. So when I ask, you know, if I was to ask you, what is the definition of a good yogi? This ain't really very easy to answer. If I'd ask 100 people, I could get 100 different answers. What is the definition of a good fighter? Well, that's pretty unambiguous, right? So we become, we don't do the art any service by turning it into yoga, by taking it out of the realm of cause and effect, making it an energy practice, and then trying to say, oh, no, this is also a martial art. We just never take it there. That and, and, you know, and a lot of teachers would do this. In internal arts, it's hard because stuff is purposely hidden from you. So teachers that I'd come across, ones that would show me obvious power, whole body power, and unambiguous force, then they would hide it. I'd be, okay, I know it's there. So I know he's actually hiding something from me because he showed me that it's there. Then I get the teachers who would hide it or say they're hiding it from you, and they never show you. So how the hell am I supposed to know, right? There's no way for me to be able to learn through this because we don't have a, a, a fair arena of cause and effect that is unambiguous. So yoga, and that's why I use yoga as the analogy, because a lot of people will want to make Taiji yoga. It's an energy practice. It's soft. It's about moving. No, it's a martial art. And if you can't create unambiguous force, then you're not doing tidy. And so similarly, if I ask what's a definition of a good yogi, you know, I ask a lot of people this who do yoga. Oh, well, maybe they're flexible. Well, okay, but there's a lot of gymnasts who are very flexible. Does that mean they're also a good yogi? Or they know about energy movement 
Okay, well, how do I know this is energy movement? The only way we can agree on energy is through manifesting it in force. And that becomes the cause and effect relationship where we can have meaningful conversations about energy, intent, desire, because short of that, we're just speaking philosophy, which is good for conversation, but we can't take it anywhere further than that. And martial arts is not philosophy. It's not yoga. It needs to be grounded in unambiguous martial skill, first and foremost. And what I find fascinating is that martial artists from that context came to the philosophy. And it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't philosophers who said, I'm going to go dabble in martial arts. No, it was martial artists who said, you know what? Everything I'm doing is in harmony with this philosophy. I'm going to use that to encode my art. And uh, unfortunately, as we see today, internal arts don't have a reputation for being able to fight. They don't, the videos you see, you tend to see closer to like uh, touchless knockout masters who wave their hands around and throw people around the room from across the room. I never came across it, you know? And so I came across people who were saying they can knock you out across the room. But when it comes down to put it in the arena, a cause and effect, it doesn't hold water. So far it, it hasn't. And so, you know, I guess if I was to put a message out there for people who are wanting to practice martial arts and internal martial arts, especially is ground yourself in martial arts. <laughs> So this means go, you know, go get beat up by kickboxers. Go get choked out by jujitsu guys. You need to get comfortable in the realm of martial arts. Then we can have conversations about chi and intent and all of this stuff because we can tie it back to unambiguous martial arts, which in my opinion should be unambiguous. Um, and a lot of the teachers I came across that were suspect it always came down to manifesting Li, a force. So you give me all the talk and philosophy and their forms and everything. And then it's like, okay, let me feel, hit me, push me, throw me around. And it's, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. Or, oh, no, 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 Taiji doesn't do that. And that was the big red light going off. I don't know. Whereas the guys who I'd say, okay, let me feel, hit me, push me. And they get a big grin on their face. You see a whole nother, a whole nother thing is going on here. That's like, you know, that's what they want to do. Is they want to show you they can throw you around and beat you up, not hide that from you and mystify it and blow all of this smoke. So those type of teachers, you tell them, please stop hitting me, <laughs> not, oh, please hit me or stop throwing me around, right? Because, you know, I guess the way I think about it is if you have energy, it wants to do work, right? And I guess if we're to look at a Western definition of energy, it's something like the ability to do work or the ability to put matter into motion. And so martial artists that have energy, they, it wants to do work. It wants to express itself on you. And so those were the teachers I came across that I didn't feel like they were trying to blow a bunch of smoke and hide stuff. And what that give, what gave me is, well, now I have the lead component, the force of the internal harmonies. And that's the thread that you pull on to try to understand what they mean by chi, which gets to be even more of a longer conversation of all the nuance used there. But most basically, the product of chi is force. And that's what me and you can, can talk and test each other is through force. So with our class, you know, I try to have you push me or I try to have you give me a force and feel force. And then we can agree in that arena on, we both agree this is what it is. Now we can get more abstract from that sure footing where we're on the same page. Um, and unfortunately, most internal arts guys you come across, they don't want to do that. It's very religious. It's very, oh, just practice for long enough. And all of a sudden, you'll be a wonderful fighter. And this golden aura will cover your body. And it's like, 
this is all religion. It's faith-based. Martial arts is not a faith-based belief system, although often it becomes such. Mm. And uh, this is a, a big problem in my opinion. I remember when we were working together, uh, you know, you really emphasized the standing meditation, which I'm also fond of, although still definitely a beginner in, but it's, you know, it's been a very helpful practice for me. And I remember um, how to put it. Yeah, you were having me push you and like, I recall there was basically at first, like the way you were holding your body, I could push you and then you changed something and I could not push you. And uh, how would you describe what was happening there? Um, nothing mystical, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Arguably, uh, okay, so I'd first have you push me and I would then like structurally disconnect and you'd feel the repercussions of you pushing on me and then pushing me over when my arch collapses or my hip moves or all the, the physical adjustments. But I guess to oversimplify it, standing practice clues us in on efficiency because we're trying to hold a posture for a very long period of time eventually. We're trying to do it in a very relaxed manner. Our body goes through a settling process to find the most efficient ground path available to us. And with time, you will start to feel the best way to hold yourself up is by aligning your bones in the most efficient manner. Our bones are incredibly strong. They don't exert any uh, fuel source to resist you. We just have to hold them in the correct geometric relationships to stack our bones so they receive most of the force. So that was kind of what I was doing with you. Is I'd, I'd, You'd push on me, and then I'd, I'd resist you with muscle. And you can feel muscle contraction, and you can feel the force, which is the product of muscle. Then I would focus on holding my posture so I'm more like furniture. So I don't push back on you, but you push on me and you feel like you're pushing on a solid structure. And what I feel is I try to relax. I try to align myself efficiently. So your pushing goes along with my own body weight right into my feet. And effectively, I feel as though you're pushing on my feet through my body. And you would notice I was pretty relaxed. I don't want muscle contraction. That actually picks me up off of the ground and pulls my bones away from each other. If anything, I was relaxing, making myself heavy, aligning my hips and legs and feet primarily and sternum when we pushed up higher so that I could feel your force goes through a relaxed route. And this route is created through standing finding efficiency because my body weight needs to find the most relaxed route and your pushing goes just along with my body weight which I've already trained is the first idea so I had you push on me passively or where I was passive and I was kind of functioning like an arch I was just receiving your force putting it into the ground not giving anything back then I was pushing back by functioning more like the bow and the arrow so you'd push on me and you'd feel I would give, but I wouldn't get pushed over. If anything, I was like spring loading as you push. And then when I would push back, you'd notice it was my whole body pushing from my lower center directly, no hands involved. I would effectively do the other extreme of releasing the spring. And now I use the same ground path that I was relaxing through, except now I'm pushing back off of the earth into you again. So, and that's where I say force is critical in the beginning because it's unambiguous. You either push me over or you don't. You can start to feel force created by muscle contraction as opposed to by aligning your bones and stretching your connective tissues correctly. And that's the thread you pull on to understand your own body is by feeling it in someone else initially which is where it's very hard to do, especially internal arts over the internet, which mm -hmm. Cam was finding. It's very hard for me to say, feel this, because you can't feel it through a picture. Yes. Thus, the idea is internal. You can, you can feel some of it, but you can't see it through the video or the picture. Mm -hmm. 
what yeah that's that's sort of uh <clears throat> how should i say so i think um something i'm yeah, more of related to that is just like i feel very motivated to learn these practices but it feels like actually being around you would be more helpful to practice them and so since i live this like wandering life like i imagine i'll come to new mexico again at some point but uh you know the ideal if i if, if my if my sole goal which is not if my sole goal were to learn the martial arts then it would be like okay move to new mexico train with blaze uh you'd have the same issue i ran into when i asked my dad he said oh you need a school mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you need a laboratory because really you don't just need me in the same way I couldn't learn from just my dad. You need me, you need every other different person who's at every other different stage mm. from more advanced to less advanced and the same body type. And so the more case studies you get and the more laboratory time you have, the more you're going to understand this thing. And, mm. uh, and you're right. The fact it's like, you know, I could theoretically teach you some basic body mechanics over the internet. The external aspect, you could theoretically get some information through a video. Internal, that's the whole idea is you can't see this. You mm -hmm. have to go deeper and that's tricky. And, you know, and that's partly why to find people that have gone through this process, you have to exert more time, more money, travel farther distances because you'll find that there's just not people who have trained this everywhere you look. And you will get up to a certain level and then you'll realize you need higher level case studies and higher level people to throw you around. I mean, that's a big part of it is Theory is great, but you just need someone to manhandle you with whole body <laughs> power, and then it's unambiguous. Yeah. And then you kind of connect those two realities of here's the theory they're talking about, here's the experiential aspect of it. How do those two relate? Mm -hmm. Which you know kind of was my TED talk idea of that. Of you need those two components. Yes. Yeah, and so, so the question there is like given. I mean, I, I, I'm familiar with what my own goals are and what my situation is, and that's that's sort of what it is. But, you know, I do the standing practice and the Sun Tai Chi every day and have sort of a sense of how to practice the Sun Tai Chi well, and I have a teacher that I work with for that. And I wonder, uh, and, you know, he gives me advice about the the standing as well, but I'm curious what you would suggest about, like, hmm, how to put it, yeah, like what you would suggest about the standing practice, because um there there are there are definite benefits that i've gotten out of it so far and uh, reasons that i want to keep practicing it but it's not obvious to me that the way i'm currently practicing would like lead to what i saw your body being able to do just in standing like not even fighting no. but like that i couldn't push you for example that i i don't think i'm actually working on being rooted in that well, way well and i get this a lot especially with people who have done some internal arts or chi bone and they'll tell me they've done standing and they'll i'll often hear oh i know i was having chi move mm. or i know my standing and the standing i have done has been producing some effect and when we analyze that and i could ask you the same question is how do you know that mm -hmm. how do you know you're getting benefit from your standing and this is a very relevant question and I say this because you can mess yourself up with standing too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can undo your body and cause problems with standing. How do we know what we're doing is good or bad? Well, that's where the force comes in. And if you're doing it wrong and you have force, pretty quickly your body is going to be telling you you're doing this wrong. Mm -hmm. However, if you do it wrong and we always do it in a soft noodly passive kind of way you're never going to experience that and then you practice that way for a long period of time and you've done anti-standing and what i find is people have imploded themselves with standing because they're not creating ground path which creates greater force potential they're finding ground path that allows them to implode to a greater extent 
So yes, they're using less muscle and they are relaxed, but this is not a beneficial relaxed condition. So, you know, the classics will say relaxed or soft, but not weak, hard, but not stiff. So the only way, in my opinion, to really know you're doing standing correctly is by the strength you can manifest as a result. And that is unambiguous. And that is as unambiguous as when you push on me, how you can feel you're probably not going to push me over. Um, so when I talk with people who do a lot of standing and I ask them that question, how do you know you're making progress with standing? These are the answers I tend to get. Well, I can feel energy moving or I can feel myself. I'm more relaxed or I can feel that I'm more grounded or, I, you know, you get every kind of, body sensation and me and you can't use this to find truth i may have radically different body sensations in standing than you have and i will get a lot of students will say well my teacher says when he stands his foot tingles and his elbow gets hot but i only feel my knee get numb and my hip hurt so am i doing this wrong i don't know because body sensations, we can't trust. We get all kinds of weird stuff show up with standing from body hallucin uh, hallucinations. You swear your foot is in one direction and it's facing another direction. These are in many ways not as meaningful as people tend to make them be in the beginning. And I say this because if we don't understand the result of our standing, it turns into a faith-based practice. And we start to then search for reasons or benefits for doing this thing that are not entirely obvious. And that is inherently problematic in my opinion. My opinion, the product of standing should be unambiguous and it should be whole body manifestation of whole body force off the earth. And this will show up in a way that is radically different from other people. You can't fake your way through this. So with the pole pushing, you notice it's not like you could do it a different way and get the same result. It's a black or white thing. You either have it or you don't. And so when people have a little bit of practice under their belt, I try to bring them back to reality on standing of we're not standing for body sensations. So I'm not going to tell you whenever you feel tingling all over, you're done. And that's how you know you're doing it. Right. We are standing to sew our body together in a unified manner, which produces unambiguous whole body power. And that is testable as clear as night and day should be. Short of that, we get into the yoga problem. How do we know what our, our experience is? It's not so obvious. Maybe I'm more flexible or maybe I can stand for longer periods of time. But remember, we're doing a martial art. And so they didn't stand because it had some abstract religious faith-based reason for it. They did standing practices because it had a utilitarian outcome. You could physically do stuff better than before. So at some point, that direct cause and effect relationship got taken out and standing and qigong turned into a faith-based practice. Just feel the qi, just do it long enough, just relax. And then you hear these, a lot of teachers, you, you see their... Uh, them teaching their students and you hear just relax more oh you need to relax or sink the chi what does this even mean this is not very uh, accessible to a cause and effect uh, environment so i don't want standing to be abstract in that way at least not in the beginning i want standing to be very obvious with the product of it and we can't really do that with neglecting the force or the lead component. So in your shoes, I would say if your teacher is teaching you standing or teaching you forms, 
have him throw you around with the mechanisms that these should be instilling or have him show you unambiguous force because that is the product of the three internal harmonies. And it's not sensations, it's not feelings or perceptions, it's strength, it's force. And they're pretty clear about that in internal arts. Mm -hmm. However, you will hear teachers neglect that. No, Taiji is all soft, it's all slow, it's never a force. No. And not just a large force. In the beginning, yes, create more force, large force, unambiguous force. As you go more, it's more subtle than that. And you start to look at, you know, forces for joint locking are not just big. They have to be clever and intelligent and choking is the same thing. You got to look at the anatomy and physiology to get the joints or the uh, body to move in a certain way. So this is not abstract. This was all developed with a very definitive goal in mind. And standing was just to help further that goal of a martial art. We could argue Qigong, that's not the case. We could argue Qigong has taken some movements. They say, we don't care about martial arts. We're going to make a yoga version out of it just to get energy flowing. I, uh, I am not a huge fan of that approach. I'd say it's better than sitting on your sofa, but it's very easy to delude yourself into thinking you're getting results that are not really very meaningful. So Qigong should lead to the same qualities of movement that martial arts should, although it's not as easy to get it because it's disconnected from function. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I don't know how that helps you necessarily because you're in a conundrum. And, then, you know, and that is like I was talking with Cam, it's the same thing. It's not easy to find people that have this and get an environment where you can... Uh, really immerse yourself in it and you do the best you can and uh as much as, as big as your desire is that's how much you'll go out and find this you know mine was big enough i got rid of all my stuff and i moved to china um stopped everything i was doing for that time and was you know able to focus on it so that's going to be the ultimate factor as to what you get out of this how bad do you want it mm -hmm. and then finding the people that have it and it won't be just one person. You know, you got to go out there. You got to see the good, the bad, everything in between and get hands on with as many people as you can so that, that there's no smoke that's muddying up everything. You can clearly see what their essence of their style is about. And mm -hmm. uh, some styles should be no exception. You should definitely see standing form produces force that is not just greater but it's different than the average person so like the pushing we did i've done that with hundreds of different people and even big weightlifter types are not much better at it than you know some of the best people i've done that with are young kids because they're natural and they just feel what they want to do uh so, you know, I, I'll say that everybody's a little different in how they go about it, but we got to stay in that arena of unambiguous cause and effect and expressing clear force through our practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've covered a lot of ground and there's definitely more I could ask you about, but I wonder if there's anything that you'd like to say more about or talk more about. Uh, well, you know, I'm not sure exactly your audience or what those who listen would find most relevant, um, other than, you know, in the martial arts context, uh, don't accept wooden nickels, you know, you really want to chew, chew before you swallow and, uh, and in similar way, try to, uh, I guess, you know, the classic analogy is be the empty cup, but um, the more of an initial desire you come to something with, the more it kind of can paint the reason you come to it. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll leave you with one of the analogies which is commonly used of the cup. In the, the ideal student is the empty cup. Everything you 
all the knowledge you give them, they fill up unadulterated and they retain it all. You then get the student, which is the upside down cup and won't retain or accept anything you record. And these are the students you go to teach something and they, well, my uncle who's in the Marines told me to do this. Okay, well, go learn from your uncle in the Marines. They're not gonna uh, receive any of the information you're giving, it all just splashes off. You then get the cup that's the cup with a hole in the bottom. And slowly everything goes in and dribbles out. These are the students you teach the same stuff to every week and they never seem to get it. Uh, then you get the student, which is the cup that has poison in it. And so everything you give them gets tainted with their personal garbage, whatever that is. And those are the students you teach something and then they adapt it to fit themselves because it's easier or they like it more or they make it something other to cater towards their personal deviations in garbage. And in many ways, those students are the worst because they then taint and pass on tainted liquid from that point on. So in all reality, every student is a little bit of every cup. Ideally, if you're gonna learn something, you go there with a, a empty cup, you see what they got, but you don't get stuck into relying on faith. And a lot of teachers will, will ask you to rely on faith. Oh, we never fight, but I know we could if it was to happen. I never hit anything, but if I was to, I would just kill you. Therefore, I could never hit you. And you, when you analyze it, you, it, it's reduced to faith in this thing. Not having gone out and, and developed this. It's you think it'll work or you have faith that it will. And that's a... That is, is religion, not martial arts. And that is a common issue is a lot of martial arts fill the role of religion for people, which if that's what you're after, great. There's nothing wrong with that other than you're kind of doing something else at that point. Um, so, you know, students who want to learn martial arts, the quicker you are true with yourself about what's your desire to learn in the first place, you can best address that and, and either genuinely learn martial arts or come to the conclusion, you didn't really want martial arts for that, but you wanted it for some other reason. You know, a lot of people, they just maybe don't have much of a personality and they just want a club they can fit in and wear the shirts of their style. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's primary to the martial arts is, is some other stuff. So, uh, the truer you are to your own desires, the quicker you'll proceed and find that with what you're trying to get. And uh, if you can do martial arts, keep it martial. Don't, don't turn it into yoga or turn it into some faith-based thing. And you will then see the clear cause and effect relationships of why these arts have been developed the way they have. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's excellent advice. And I appreciate you sharing that. And also, thank you for your time and speaking with me today. It's been uh, really, really interesting to learn more about you and your yeah. life and your practice. So thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, we will be in touch here in the future if you make it back by again. Sounds good, friend. <laughs>